Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or IMS in short, is a university level research institute at NUS. Its mission is to promote interest and research in the mathematical sciences and their applications. It brings together foreign and local mathematicians and scientists of diverse backgrounds for interaction, cross-fertilization of ideas, and collaboration in research. It also organizes public lectures to inform the general public of new discoveries, interesting ideas and applications in mathematics, and school lectures to stimulate the students to stimulate the students' interest in the mathematical sciences and in pursuing scientific careers. This evening's public lecture is organized by the Institute in conjunction with the Singapore Mathematical Society and the NUS Department of Mathematics. The speaker is Professor Tony Chan of the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor Tony Chan received <coughs> both his MS, both his BS Engineering and MS <coughs> Aeronautics degrees from the California Institute of Technology in 1973, and his PhD degree in Computer Science from Stanford University in 1978. <coughs> he taught at Yale University from 1979 to 1986 until he was lured by UCLA. He has been chair of the UCLA Method Department of Mathematics, director of the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, an NSF-funded institute, and is currently dean of the Division of Physical Sciences at UCLA. He has served on the SIME Council and many SIME and U.S. national committees. SIME is not Thailand but stands for Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. He also serves on the editorial board of the SIME Journal of Scientific Computing, Numerical Mathematics, the Asian Journal of Mathematics, and Numerical Algorithms. Professor Chan has very broad research interests which lie in interdisciplinary mathematics. His current research projects include differential equation-based image processing and computer vision, multi-scale computational methods, optimizational and algebraic multi-grid methods for VLSI circuit layout, and algorithms on advanced architecture parallel computers. He is both a visionary administrator and an outstanding mathematician, and has played an active role in promoting the application of mathematics to real-life problems. With his vast experience in the application of mathematics, he is an ideal person to speak on what's meant to do with it, mathematics at the frontiers of sciences and, math and technology. Before I invite Professor Chan to deliver his lecture, I would like to tell you that we discovered two years ago that his parents-in-law are close friends of my brothers, my brothers-in-law's parents-in-law. <laughs> which suggests the conjecture that this world is a simply connected graph. <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to invite Professor Chan to de de deliver his lecture. Tony. Thank you very much, uh, Luis, for a very, very uh, flattering introduction. Uh, it is a great honor to be asked to give this public lecture, even more so than this morning. I was the opening speaker of the symposium at, uh, workshop at the IMS. And with this audience here, uh, I'm really uh, flattered. Uh, 
this is a public lecture uh, about mathematics. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a risky business. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's late in the day. Some of you are hungry. Uh, I don't want to get too serious. You know, uh, mathematics is a technical subject. But what I do want to get across is, uh, is sort of uh, the lighter side, but also with the serious message. Uh, in other words, I think mathematics is an exciting field. It, is, uh, it's, uh, it impacts all of us uh, in our everyday life. Even if you don't think mathematics has anything to do with your everyday life, you, sh you should know something about it. Because I would say as a, as a citizen, as someone who, uh, a member of the society who had, might have to vote, for example, you have to know something about mathematics and science so that you can be better informed to make decisions. I mean, in a way, that not, nobody expects everyone to, to be engaged with mathematics in a highly technical way. So I hope to be able to, uh, to uh, get that message across. Uh, I, uh, I aim to entertain, really, at this point, not to get too serious. I try very hard to not to get too many equations in, into the slides. So for the, especially for the younger members of the audience, uh, I hope uh, it's not exactly a video you know, game encounter, but uh, hopefully it won't be just uh, highly technical. I should say that uh, you're not hearing from one who is sort of, uh, I'm a recent convert to mathematics, let me put it that way. Uh, it's uh, Professor Trefethen, who's a distinguished professor from uh, Oxford, who's also visiting here, reminded me. He said, Tony, you don't really have a degree in mathematics. <laughs> Which is true. He's one of the few of my long-time long -time fans who knows this fact. Uh, as you heard, my PhD was in computer science. Uh, my undergrad was uh, from Caltech in various sort of applied science engineering area. Uh, so even though I uh, have been chair of a math department, uh, director of a math institute, I don't really, I'm not a card-carrying you know, <laughs> uh, mathematician. But I think that makes me uh, more objective, I would say, would you think? So uh, uh, sort of mathematics has to sort of earn my respect, <laughs> so to speak, uh, for it. And uh, I would say I'm a, really a convert for now. So as they say, sit back and relax. Uh, hopefully, we'll just spend the next 50 minutes or so uh, going through uh, some of, uh, sort of my view of uh, how mathematics fits into your everyday life. So hopefully, if you come away with one or two thoughts in your head, I would have accomplished my goal. Okay. So uh, first thing I should say is, where do I get this title? I love this title. For those of you who don't know, there's a famous song, you know, with a title very close to that. You, you, how many of you know about the song that I'm talking about? <laughs> wow. This is a very few. That's amazing. How many of you heard of Tina Turner? Okay. So you know he has, she has a song called What's Love Got to Do With It? Okay, now that's much more serious business. But this is the, the uh, inspiration for this came from that song. So the idea is, you know, math... Uh, it's not obviously connected to things. So what's math got to do with it? That's sort of the first question people ask. So I hope to convince you of the subtitle. That's sort of the, the idea. I, I really cannot take credit for that title because let me say, I, I don't usually go around and give public talks like this. So this is a new experience for me. Uh, but I, I have given this talk two or three times. The first time I gave this talk was uh, just uh, two years ago, perhaps, to the parents of freshmen at UCLA. Okay, so it's aimed at that level. <laughs> so, okay, so, so they come from all walks of life. I don't, I don't mean they... Okay, so, and uh, that's when we get this idea. So I started this uh, by listing what I, what I call uh, math myths. Okay? Uh, I know many of you are mathematicians. And uh, uh, you, I'm sure you have the experience where you meet some of your relatives, let's say at Christmas, okay, and they say, oh, you're a math department, uh, you, you're in the math department, you're a math professor, and you get a kind of uh, reaction that is hard to describe, okay, so, right, it's like, wow, you know, they have a lot of respect for you, but they know you're like, might as well be from Mars, okay, that's sort of, it's like a combination of all respect, but also, 
inscrutability. You know, I would say a combination of all of this. So I try to just combine it. So the first thing is fear. Okay, the first thing is fear. I, I know you, you know exactly what I mean. Math, you know, oh, I did that in high school. I was terrible, and I don't even touch. I can't even balance my checkbook, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, another one is you cannot understand it. I mean, if you're someone from even the medical school across the street, you say, oh, that's, you know, this guy, I don't understand it at all. It's inscrutable. This uh, it's uh, thanks to Esmond. Where's Esmond? <laughs> so we were having dinner the other night right here in Singapore. I said, I'm giving this talk. I said, oh, you know, man, it's boring. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is a new line. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also, I, I have two kids who are teenagers who they are studying math and they just couldn't understand why they have to study math. So, another one, this is a little bit more serious. When you talk to a lot of people who are not in this area, they will say, well, what's there left to do in math? Didn't, uh, you know, it's all in the books. I know, you know, the Romans and the Greeks, they all did that. What's there to do? What will you do? You're supposed to be a professor. I mean, other than teach, they will ask, how many hours do you teach a day? I said, I don't know. Uh, I teach maybe three hours a week, <laughs> okay? He said, what do you do the rest of the time, you know? So, so they said, well, what I say, I do research. I said, what, what, is, what is research in math? What does that mean, you know? So they don't, they, this idea that math is a live subject, that we are constantly creating new things and adding to our body of knowledge, is actually a, a foreign concept to many people. The other thing is now, this is more I'm talking about my position as dean, because I talk to physicists and chemists and biologists and geoscientists and so on. And the common view is that math is actually different from the other sciences, even though we are all part of science I and mean, we're in the same division typically, probably here in NUS too. You, you, I mean, in the old days, math could be part of the arts, right? You can get a Bachelor of Arts, but these are mostly in, in science. And, uh, you know, my colleagues in the other department, they say, okay, you know, these math guys, they, they're over there. They, they're, you know, really great people, but nothing to do what I do. It's not part of the science enterprise, for example. One thing you can check this out is, uh, even though it's, it's sort of a litmus test, you go to science and nature. Right? These are supposed to be two of the world's leading journals in science. You, you check to see how many articles in math you see in there. Okay? Now, there are actually articles about math, but they could be published by physicists, chemists, and geoscientists, and so on, but they're very, very few. And when there's an article in math, usually it's about some esoteric uh, things that is like, uh, uh, well, I don't want to go, <laughs> I should be careful what I say, but it's something that is not, they, the reason they publish that is not because it's connected to what they do, it's because it's sort of an interesting thing, uh, something about human activities, a breakthrough. It's like I, I usually call this, oh, someone just climbed Mount Everest. Okay, that's worth, it's newsworthy, and therefore it's there. So a little bit of that. I talk to a lot of students, obviously, I'm in a university. This is a thing that uh, a lot of people think about. Well, if I study math, what do I do? I mean, one thing you have to notice, you have to realize, is that a lot of students with talents in mathematics are also good at other things. In particular, they're very good at computers, usually, right? So it's sort of, or music, you know, so, well, they know music, you can, <laughs> it's not a good job prospect. So if a computer, at least until recently, has a lot of jobs, right? So they said, why should I study math? I mean, I study computer science or whatever. Okay, so that's the, that's the other one. And worse yet, as I said, that's the title of my talk, is that what has it got to do with my life, right? So that's, what's it got to do with me? So let me come back to this uh, math equal to fear. You have a question? Or? Actually, you could replace what's math in the previous slide with philosophy. Ah, okay, that's a good interesting view. I, so the, I don't know whether everybody heard that. You could repeat the, the question. You could repeat what I said there in the slide by replacing math by philosophy or classics or whatever you will. Almost. Almost. But there, hopefully you get, I, I think you cannot say that philosophy is the frontier of science and technology. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, you said not equal to science. Not equal to science. philosophy or science, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Okay. So, Okay, actually that's part of my point. But anyway, coming back to this. This is in the front page of LA Times uh, a few years ago. So math equals fear. <laughs> that's, that's not literal. What they're talking about is uh, 
math at the college level is often viewed as just an artificial hurdle that a lot of people have to go through. You, if you don't take math, you cannot go on to do whatever, okay? So it, it really uh, has, has this uh, problem. But it's not so bad, okay? So starting recently, you see a lot of math coverage in the media. I just uh, outlined a few of these. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie. I've seen it five times on United Airlines. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, Beautiful Mind is about John Nash, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, and uh, he's a well-known mathematician. Okay, so this, okay, so that's one. Goodwill Hunting is one that is a little bit earlier. It's about a math genius who was a janitor at MIT, who somehow did a lot of wonderful things. You all heard about Andrew Wiles. The, Wiles, the, uh, he proved the Fermat's last theorem. I don't know how long ago now, probably six, seven years ago. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know how many of you know about this. How many of you have seen this movie by Dustin Hoffman? Highly recommended. Okay. In a way, this is sort of the real math. It's a story about real mathematician, research mathematician. If you think about this, what, is, what do these things say about mathematics? If you, if you have seen this uh, thing. Uh, beautiful mind. Obviously, John Nash was a genius. You know, he looked at the wall of this number and he can solve the, you know, the coding problem. But he went crazy. I mean, right? So, so uh, well, you know, many people say, you know, the movie is really, uh, is, is a love story. It's about, you know, it's human psychology and so on. I mean, you can enjoy it at that level. But if you look at his message about mathematician, it's actually not so flattering in a way. You know, you were born with it or you don't have it. That's it, you know, so what can you do about it? Same thing here. He's a janitor, completely uneducated. He just knew how to prove things. That even a big professor at MIT were impressed. Okay. Uh, Andrew Wise, now that's a real, that's a real life mathematician. The other one, the, well, I, this one is, you know, in a Ron Howard movie, is a little bit, you know, uh, uh, he took some liberty in terms of making it uh, into a story. But Andrew Wise is a sort of a hero of professional mathematician. He really is a hero. A lot of people really look at him that way. But what, if you know the story about how he, how he proved this, he was, uh, the story goes, I mean, that he started when he was 10 years old, he's British, and uh, he knew that he wanted to prove this thing. He, he was interested in that from that point on. He got tenure, he, uh, he graduated from Cambridge, he became a professor at Princeton, these are the top math places in the world. And then he got tenure, then he, one day he said, okay, I'm gonna prove the math theorem. So he locked himself up in the attic, like a monk, you know, in a way. You know, lock himself up. Even his wife did not know he was doing this. And uh, so seven years later, he announced that he approved this thing. But he was wrong, actually, at that point. But he fixed it. Later on, it was fixed up. So this is sort of, if that's the idea of math, I'm gonna, what am I doing? I'm not going to lock myself up in the attic for seven years. <laughs> you know, so, so, but if you look at it, my, mess, my, my take of this is, math is just so different from everything else. Either you were born with it, or you have to lock yourself up, you have to be dedicated in addition to be good, right? So that's sort of the message. Straw Dog is different. Straw Dog is about Dustin Hoffman is a research mathematician and he went off to do his research and, and so on and so on. That's the sort of more real life story. So in a way it's good. I think I say, say any publicity is good for, the, for anything. But in some sense it's, uh, it's sending sort of a different message, I, I would say. So I would say math is an image problem. Okay. Uh, mathematicians typically say, well, they're just smart people, but, okay, then it goes on, you feel in your own. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, this is a little, uh, the second message is more subtle. You don't hear the, the journalists do not use mathematics. I actually had to deal with journalists uh, before. I mean, they, they choose their words very carefully. They, anything technical, you don't want to use. But you do see software. Algorithm depends, maybe New York Times and certainly not, you know, some of the other uh, newspapers. Computer you see all the time. So computer has been used as a surrogate for anything mathematical or technical, right? Uh, uh, weather forecasting, right? It come from the computer. Uh, medical imaging, you go to the hospital, it's called computer-aided tomography, CAT, okay, so computer. Computer says it's got to be correct, it's got to be right. Got to be state of the art. 
So a lot of these things are actually, really, there's a, if you look into it, it's uh, math is the underlying thing. I mean, the computer is a tool, and you have to know how to use the tool very carefully, very uh, uh, wisely, very efficiently, right? So, uh, this is, a, I think, is my quote, okay? I always tell people, mathematicians have no monopoly on doing mathematics. You know, we, we don't have a license. It's, it's not like a medical doctor. You need a license or, to do mathematics. Mathematics is done by physicists, by engineers. Uh, I, right, by, so, in a way, a lot of stuff is going on uh, by other people and very smart people. So people in our field, you know, e the professional mathematician often are subsumed by other people. Some of the major advances sometimes are made by sort of non-card-carrying professional mathematician. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. I mean, from the viewpoint of uh, human society, you know, as long as someone is doing it right, it's okay, you know, so. It's often behind the scene. That's all right. Sort of my point. So in fact, that was sort of my quote. Uh, I was told you I, I had uh, had to deal with journalists. So when I first became the department head at uh, UCLA, I called up the local science writer of LA Times. So you know, after a lot of talk and so on. Uh, in fact, I remember it was around 1997. And in fact, uh, John Nash. No, uh, was it John Nash? No, he was later. Uh, it was the uh, Black Shows Merton, the Nobel Prize in Economics just came out. So I thought, okay, it's about money after all, you know, money and math. You've got to be interested in it. No, she came and talked to me about it. She was not interested in it at all. She wanted to talk about some of these things. Anyway, after a bunch of uh, several interviews, this came out. This was in the front page of LA Times. You can't read this because it was scanned in. This, this is me when I had more hair. Uh, some equations, but the point is that, you know, math wizards want respect in the equation. I, knew, I told them math is an image problem. And my quote says, I can't even read it from here. Math never gets into the story. Everyone else gets the credit. For those professional mathematicians, I'm sure you share my, my, uh, my feelings. Okay, so that was the... Uh... Now, part of the problem, part of the problem is just this math is difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, many of young people spend many years, you know, in school learning math. Now, you would think that would be give, a, give us a leg up, right? I mean, we've got a captive audience right there for many years. But I think in many cases, in most cases, it's sort of, it's a, it was a view as a traumatic experience. They said, I'm out of school, I'm not going to look at this thing again. Okay, that's sort of the, the feeling. And so I think it turned a lot of people off, okay, actually. Uh, it is difficult. It's a very rigorous science. Uh, many people don't appreciate that. In fact, the movement now in, uh, in a university is not to teach of rigor because it's afraid of turning people off, in fact. Okay? The epsilon delta you know, uh, in calculus, you don't hear about it anymore. And I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying we should do that. We're not trying to tra train everyone to be a professional mathematician. But I'm just trying to get across the point that math, it is difficult, it is technical. Okay, at, at a technical level. It's a very broad scope, mathematics. Uh, in some general sense, it's like what you, you know, I mean, for example, geometry, you don't know from high school, uh, calculus, you know, number theory, you know about differential, I mean, just huge. I mean, uh, most mathematicians do not know more than a few of these areas, professional mathematicians, in any depth. I mean, okay. So imagine for the layman. It's very abstract. In fact, one of the intrinsic uh, property of mathematics is that it's abstract. In fact, that's one of its power, actually. The power of mathematics, one of the main powers is that you can abstract things out. Because then you can abstract it, you can, you can apply it to other things. So that's a, but because of the abstraction, it, it is difficult for people to grasp. Because abstraction, Ideally, it should be based on experience, should be built on experience. But when you're learning, it's hard to have that experience. So it's sort of a vicious circle going around. So that's sort of... Okay, here's another view of mathematics. And that sort of leads to the, pro the problem that math is an image problem, okay? Because you can look at math both as an art and also as a science. If as I said, actually, you can get a Bachelor of Arts in math in many places, you get a Bachelor of Science. And you can appreciate 
and do mathematics from both perspective. They're both perfectly legitimate. And uh, I mean, you know, art, you emphasize beauty, elegance, creativity, and all of those stuffs are very, very important in, in mathematics. Okay? And you can do that on your own. Science, you know, you gotta be math is a language and a tool for science. Okay? It is the foundation of technology. So you need to also learn the technical aspect. You, you, you can't just say it's beautiful, your next cell phone won't come because of that. It, you, you have to, you know, be something real and concrete. So corresponding to those two views, there are sort of two way of, not necessarily strictly speaking two way, but two not necessarily overlapping way of looking at math. You know, you can, people call them, uh, some, traditional call them pure and applied math. And that's sort of a taboo, you know, we don't say it's like pure and impure math, okay? <laughs> okay, so no, and now we will go core mathematics and interdisciplinary mathematics. You know, the view is that you have core, it can sort of have its own development, but there's a part that connects with other outside world. So that's sort of the, the idea, okay? They're both important. I mean, the core obviously is an intellectual basis, but it's very difficult for outside to understand, okay? So that's the part of the problem. But this part, the interdisciplinary part, shouldn't be, right? Because the ideas are applications are found everywhere. Uh, you may not be doing alone, as I said. You may be, you know, professional mathematician may be doing with non-professional mathematician or, or just on their own. Uh, that's sort of the idea. So here's a picture that I summarize that view. By the way, this picture and the next one uh, come from a highly cited report from the National Science Foundation in the, in the U.S. Uh, this report comes, uh, it, the report is called the Odom Report. So O-D-O-M, o General Odom is a retired general who had this, uh, this uh, report. So if you go to Google and say Odom Report, you'll find it, I'm sure, okay? And this, this report is very uh, uh, influential. It probably was about a few years ago, four years, five years ago. And it's really affecting the way the the mathematical sciences at the National Science Foundation is, uh, is directed. Is, uh, so I, I highly recommend it, actually. So anyway, here's a picture. So the common misconception of math is this. Okay, so you have you know, finance, uh, economics, engineering, physics. Of course, they all indeed we know, they use math. But the idea is that they are sort of encapsulated in a silo. You know, the physicists do math, the economists do math, nothing to do with each other. Okay, so that. Uh, and then you have the math people doing their own thing, right? So that's the idea. But this is the idea. This is the map of the frontiers of science and technology. And this picture is from, from the report. So the idea is that you have this bigger circle. That's the key. It's not like, you don't say this is not math. Everything is math, okay? So, but part of it is in the core that don't necessarily interact with the outside world, but you have a lot of other fields that you interact. It's a continuum, really. This is just a schematic. That's sort of the, the view. By the way, this is actually how uh, the NSF in the U.S. is trying to fund research, math research. So, it, it, you know, it's a vision that uh, uh, taken seriously. So let me quickly just give a very broad overview of, uh, so what, what, what is math? I mean, I'm talking about in some general, generality. So here are some of the major subfields of the mathematical sciences. I mean, some of these, even the high school students should know, right? Because what do you learn in, in school? You learn, uh, you, you learn uh, algebra, right? So they, they are there. Uh, you learn uh, arithmetic. I don't know, maybe that's, that's sort of number theory. Uh, you learn geometry, okay, and, and so on, right? And even now, I know in high school, you learn a little bit about probability. Yeah, okay, analysis is like calculus. So these things are not new. But what is perhaps uh, uh, not so obvious to non-professionals are what they really about. I mean, if you were not a professor of math, then say, what, what is algebra? What, 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 is, what does that do? I know I'm supposed to solve equations and so on. Right? So here are some of the summary of sort of in words that describe what the field is about. And the idea here is that you, you look at it, it's really is quite general. It, it, it describes sort of very broad properties of either the natural world or the, or the artificial world. So if you look at it from that point of view, you know, map is all encompassing, really. I mean, there's nothing. Uh, 
anything quantitative, anything that uh, has a pattern to it, uh, that anything that has a structure to it, could be studied by mathematics. So that's sort of the view, a, a very broad view. Now, what about math as used in society? Uh, I list here, by the way, this is from that report, by the way, so not just from me. Uh, here are the examples that perhaps you have come across in your everyday life. Here are sort of the contribution from the various branches of mathematics that uh, I listed before. When you go to take a, a, a medical image uh, for diagnostic, you are using mathematics. Okay, I will have a little bit more to say about that. Uh, MRI means magnetic resonance imaging. CAT is computer-aided tomography. I already mentioned those two. When you do a search on the internet, you know, I, I have an example about Google later. Okay, the basis of Google is some math. Okay, so I'll say about that and some of these. Uh, when you go to Wall Street now, Wall Street are hiring physicists and mathematicians. And, uh, and so I, I don't mean just balancing the checkbook. Okay. Uh, when you do defense, of course, as that's well known. Uh, uh, security, you know, inter, you know uh, cryptography, uh, privacy. That's a big field that's just uh, emerged the last couple of decades. Of course, we all know about weather forecasting, global warming, you know, all that stuff. That's also done by computers. The human genome, that's actually newer, obviously, okay? And you see a lot of development from there. Even, even today in our workshop, there was a talk about data mining and stuff. This is, this is a, a big growth area. The way you design drugs, they call them designer drugs. <laughs> but, you know, you're designing the drug. So, okay. In uh, basic physics, the theory of everything, in terms of mathematics, geometry in particular is, is, a, is a key thing. Uh, for a long time now, since I actually had a, have a degree in aeronautics, so I know a little bit about this. For a long time now, airplanes are basically designed completely on the computer. I mean, for 20 years now. Uh, you, you basically uh, check them out in the wind tunnel. You, you do all your design and then you, you check them out. Uh, you, so, actually Airbus is uh, well known for really a, a leader in that and they, they are actually very good. Uh, okay, so I, th I think I've given you enough example. So the message there is that math is everywhere. Okay, so why is that? Is there some fundamental reason why math is that? Or is it just because uh, the mathematicians are pushy? You know, they try to, you know, you know and conquer everything or do everything. Uh, I think that it's, in fact, my, my argument is that mathematicians are not very good in point. And not very pushy, but still, yeah, that, that, that's the case. So there's some more fundamental reasons. One is, uh, of course, the nature of mathematics. Math sort of allows you to make things quantitative, okay? Be very precise. In fact, now I interact a little bit more with our non-science uh, colleagues, you know, with, uh, as, as a dean. People in the uh, humanities, social science, and so on, think very differently. You know, not everything is a well-posed problem with a unique solution and, you know, and so on. I mean, you, the world doesn't happen like that. But in many cases, in many problems, you do have that. And when you are talking, when you're trying to describe a problem, and you're trying to make it quantitative and precise, that's when you need math. I mean, and then, okay, so that's, that's one. And then, once you get it described precisely, then you have the ability, the possibility of then predicting what's going to happen. Okay, rather than just talking about it, and, 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 and so. Uh, of course, you, this, this, this is not a substitute for understanding. You still need to understand the thing. You know, that's, that's the other thing, as I said before, is that math sort of exposes the structure and patterns of nature. I mean, that's well known to you. Things that are unexpected, symmetry and so on. Okay. Uh, this is the part I like, and this is for applied repetition. This is the key aspect. Uh, this is why math is so prevalent in science and technology. And that is because most of the physical laws that govern nature, Newton's law, Maxwell's equation, Schrodinger's equations, and the equation that govern the, the flow of the climate and weather and so on, they are all expressed 
in mathematical terms for the same reason because you need to be precise you can say well the wind is going to be more more or less going this way you have to write them down uh, and and so all of these equations are uh, you know written in mathematical form and, and it's not just a language for expressing things it's not like it sounds better in math or it, it, it's a it's a it's it reads shorter in and it often does but that's not the main reason the reason is you can extract an information from it. So the mathematician, what they do is, not just to make it short and pretty and so on, but from the structure, you can extract information. That's sort of the, the, the idea. So uh, this is what the main reason why it's so useful in technology and so on, because when you build a cell phone, when you build a plane, when you, whatever you do, at the bottom of it, you are looking at these equations. Okay, that's what physics is about and what science is about. So at some point, I don't know, care whether you call yourself a scientist or engineer or whatever, you know, whatever, you have to deal with this. And that's where the math will come in. Okay? <clears throat> and then there is this famous quote. We just don't know why, but, it's, but it does. Okay, so that's sort of a famous quote. Now, since I, uh, I have a degree in computer science, I can say this. Many people, probably uh, lay people, will say, well, why do we need this? We just, you know, every time I buy this computer, it's another 10 times faster and costs half as much. I just buy a better computer. I, can, I, don't, I don't need mathematicians. Why, why do I need mathematicians? So here's a, this is the myth. First of all, part of it is because of, when you say computer, people sort of subsume a lot of things. Some of it is hardware, some of it is software, and you, some of it is algorithm, you don't really know. But here are two quotes that I actually, uh, well-known computer scientists and, uh, Actually, he's also a computer scientist at Purdue. Two quotes in two different fields. The idea is that uh, the advance in performance in getting results from computing is due much more due to software, mathematics, algorithm, and things than to just pure hardware. Now, the hardware speed is actually very, very impressive. I mean, especially at the cost. I mean, it's really quite amazing. Okay. Uh, but still, I mean, this is sort of a schematic to show that, you know, that's the big piece of the pie. It really comes from other things, things other than hardware. And this goes all the way from doing scientific problem, which is really what John Rice, many of you know, is the field is, to you know, doing cryptography, doing, you know, factoring numbers, uh, large uh, numbers. So that's sort of, probably many people do not know about this. Perhaps some of the people do not agree with this, but this is quotes from computer scientists. Okay. If you don't believe computer scientists, you believe your doctor. Okay. And in the U.S., the, the NIH, I'm sure you know, the National Institute of Health, is the big 800-pound gorilla. They, their national, the annual budget is about $40 billion for research. The National Science Foundation budget is only about four billion dollars. So, you know, so this is uh, for those of you who are familiar with the U.S. research support system. This, you understand this is the NIH. So Harold Vamos was the former director of NIH about I don't know three, four, five years ago. Uh, so this is a quote from him. Okay, he's not a mathematician. So of course NIH one of the main missions is research on disease, on medicine. You know. So he says that if you want to wage a war on disease, you need to include mathematicians and physicists and chemists and so on. You cannot do it just with the front without the support, the infrastructure. That's sort of the, the idea. So let me give you some examples now, just pictures, to illustrate my point. I will start with the Nobel Prizes, because many of you, you know, people are familiar with them. I'll start with this year's Nobel Prize. This year, Nobel Prize has many notable features, uh, for those who are familiar. One is, let's see, how does that go? The Nobel Prize in, uh, in okay, here, the Nobel Prize in medicine was really given to a chemist and a physicist. They're really chemists and physicists. The Nobel Prize in chemistry was really given to two medical doctors. Uh, uh, about membrane and transport and so on. So actually that's an interesting phenomenon because there's no, as I said, you know, you don't, you don't have a monopoly, you know, 
you can say you can't do it. It's medicine, you know. So, or it's just physics. Uh, you can't do it. You don't. Have a, you don't have a degree, so you can't do it. So, uh, but what is probably not known uh, is that one of these, this problem, this, what, what they, what the problem they solved that got them the Nobel Prize is intimately related to math. What they did, or you probably can't read it too well for their discoveries concerning magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. That's why they get the uh, Nobel Prize. I'm sure you've seen this, you know, pictures and magazines about scans of the brain, the uh, body, and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, Lauderborough is a, is a chemist from U University of Illinois for a long time. Sir Peter Mansfield from uh, England, from Nottingham, I think. Yeah who's uh, in the School of Physics and Astronomy. Okay. Uh, where, where's the math? <laughs> what does that got to do with math? <laughs> okay. So here's a, from the website. By the way, that was Nobel website. You didn't go there. This is just uh, too small, so I print them out here. Okay, so what he did was to realize that you can, well, as you, you can read it. By changing the setup, you know, the magnetic resonance phenomenon was known before. And in fact, there was a Nobel Prize given to that some time ago. But what he realized that was that you could use it to, to actually, if you introduce a gradient in the magnetic field, you can actually use the image to look inside. That was the, so that's a physical insight, okay? So, I mean, he, it's a sort of physics and chemistry kind of insight. Uh, what Sir Peter Mansfield did, though, it's more mathematical, actually. So here's a quote. What he did was, Really, he realized that uh, you can actually understand the mathematics of uh, sort of the inverse problem, we call, right? Because you, you're supposed to back out from the data that you have served. You're supposed to back out what is inside. Well, it turns out you better do that very quickly. And otherwise, you know, it's not useful for your medical diagnostic. So he realized that it's done, and then he developed extremely fast imaging, which is, <laughs> I thought, appropriate because we're having an imaging conference right here. And many of us are talking about that. But we're a bunch of mathematicians. So, okay, so that was one, one example. Last year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given uh, to uh, Kurt Wittrich. Uh, maybe a Swiss or German can pronounce it better than me. Uh, so his thing was about uh, sort of, uh, well, you can read it. The idea is you have macromolecules. It's, you know, it's about biochemistry. And you're trying to find out where things line up. Think about finding out proteins and uh, other. And what he did, I mean, they were given to three people. This is one of, the, one of the three. What he did was actually, this is, by the way, a quote from the Nobel website. It's really a mathematical method. Basically, it's geometry. You sort of look at this DNA you know, molecule, whatever, you know, twisting all over the place. And you observe some projections of it, some two-dimensional version of it, or some data that you collect. You're supposed to back out that three-dimensional structure. That was sort of the difficult, and this is very difficult. By the way, there was a talk today earlier in our workshop about this. Uh, Esman talked about that. Uh, so you don't call it boring, I hope. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so that was, uh, that, that was it. I, okay, so that was uh, the Nobel Prize in 2002. You're going a little bit back, I already mentioned this, right, 1997. There was a Nobel Prize given in economics. By the way, there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics. You, you know that, right? So, but of course, it doesn't mean a mathematician can't get Nobel Prizes. You have to get it in some other field. Okay. So in particular, uh, that was given uh, to these three people. One of them was dead. Uh, I think Black was dead, right? So Merton and Black were are were mathematician actually shows as an economist e economist but of course it is not so clean cut i mean they they do these problems now uh i don't know how many of you know about this right these are called uh uh options derivatives derivative is not calculus derivative you know it's stock derivatives uh this is what big business big money uh uh in fact i remember uh I, i'm not an expert on this uh, but I had a cocktail party about that time, actually. Uh, I ran into a broker, a stock broker. So he's just a friend, right? So uh, not a friend, I just met him there. So I said, uh, 
hey, you know, there was this Nobel Prize that was just given. Uh, do you know about this? I said, I don't know. He said, he said, have you heard of Black Shows? He said, oh, yes, I know Black Shows. It's a button on my computer, on my calculator. So, you know, you can get one of these little handheld the brokers use. It just says Black Shows. He press the button and come, comes the price. That's all. So for, for him, that was it. <laughs> and this is a true story. I, was, I said, wow. You know, so, so, uh, so it, it is used widely. But the mathematics of when, you know, in fact, here's a, a, I got this from the NOVA. You know, in the US, it's a public broadcasting uh, uh, television. They had a special about this. They called it the formula that shook the world. Well, here's a formula. <laughs> OK, I mean, this is the strike price. And I mean, it's, it's not very complicated, actually, what, what, what they did. Oh, actually, to be fair, what they did was not to solve a mathematical problem. OK, to be fair, they, they have uh, economic concepts and so on. But it is an the formula to shook the world. There's a lot of mathematics. If you go to the business school, by the way, actually, the business school here just uh, started a program with UCLA. I, I know that. So but anyway, if you go to the business school, uh, you go to their finance department. There are a lot of mathematicians there. They're very, very, uh, uh, actually, sometimes more pure than, than let's say, me. I mean, they, they prove theorems, and they have, you know, very, very uh, mathematical subject. OK, so as you can see. Uh, so the kind of mathematics used in, in finance is more than arithmetic. It's more than balancing the checkbook. I mean, everything, stochastic, differential equation, probability, computational methods. Uh, you know, for example, there are the examples of core math. I just a good example to use that. They're sort of a, a stochastic extension to calculus, to classical calculus, called Ito calculus. Ito is a Japanese mathematician. OK, so you know, when your delta and epsilon are actually not deterministic, but stochastic, turns out things don't quite behave like we learn in, in our sophomore year. Uh, Monte Carlo methods and the application, as I said here. So that is a good example. It's a very active field, and many well-known people working in this. I, I thought it was interesting because uh, this Merton is one of the three who, uh, who got the Nobel Prize. He actually, you look at his thing, he's a, he's a mathematician. Really. You know, he got his Caltech, applied math. Uh, I was in that department, so I felt, I mean, not the same time. But, uh, but uh, in fact, here's a quote from, uh, by the way, I highly recommend this Nobel website, by the way. It's where you go there. They, every Nobel laureate is supposed to write a biography, not, not technical. You know, where they grew up, who influenced them, you know, stuff like that. Actually, a very interesting reading. But anyway, here's what he wrote, you can see. So he said he really, okay, I nevertheless was able to take mathematics through the calculus of five-year science. I also believe that my mathematical engineering training might give me some advantage in analyzing complex situations. So that's sort of, you know, if your teacher says that, you say, ah, but here's a Nobel laureate who says that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, there you go. By the way, we mentioned he was one of the big invited speakers at the Siam meeting, I remember, not so long ago. So you heard about Siam, there was professional suicide. So those are the Nobel Prizes. Uh, but here are things that I think might get the Nobel Prize. Not yet. So here's another medical imaging uh, modality. It's called PET. It stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Positron is one of those particles that the physicists invented, uh, not for medicine, but anyway, now it's used in, okay. So the, the difference here is that it, it not only look at the physical properties of the tissues and bones, but it looks at uh, the uh, metabolism rate and so on. So a typical example you see in magazine is when you're thinking about something, they can see what, which part of your brain is active. That's, that's mostly PET because it detects sort of how much sugar is being burned and stuff like that, okay? And uh, tomography, it's a, it's a mathematical concept, okay? So what is tomography? I often give this example. So think of an array of numbers, three by three. Okay, there are some integers, you know, there are nine numbers. <laughs> tomography means the following. Let's say I sum up the rows. I, I give you the sum of the, some of the columns, some of the rows, some of the diagonals. And now you're supposed to get me those numbers. Okay, that, that roughly is what tomography is about. So if I tell you that, it's like, well, that's a mathematical problem. 
right? And in fact, it is. I mean, mathematicians have studied this. A uh, famous uh, mathematician, there's a famous Radon transform, some of you know. Uh, and these things are actually useful here. Okay, uh, so my bet is that there will be a Nobel Prize in PET probably sometime, hopefully in my lifetime. Uh, the kind of uh, mathematics use, I already mentioned some of these, so I don't want to sort of go into too much details. Okay, many of actually of the mathematicians here, I know are interested in this problem. Okay. Another one, you all heard about a human genome project. There will be a Nobel Prize in, in some field related to that, I'm sure. Okay, maybe actually quite soon, who knows. Uh, in all these sort of functional genomics problems, it's, uh, it's a very new, by the way. This is sort of like a gold rush in some sense. Uh, there's a lot of mathematics involved. I mean, we don't, you don't have to know the technical details. It's just a pretty picture to get, get your attention. <laughs> I don't know how to interpret them, okay? So, uh, but for the very reason that mathematics, that biology, I should say, biology has gone through a tremendous revolution, actually, in the last 50 years since the DNA was you know, discovered, the structure of the DNA. So what you end up with, biology before was very much an empirical experimental science, right? You go into the lab and you, you do it. But now, you know, it's a quantitative science, at the very least. You know, everything is built from the four genes, A, G, C, T, and they combine and, you know. So now it becomes more like science, uh, physical science and engineering, actually, in a way. Now, of course, you have to understand the biology, but it's much more sort of combined that way. There's a lot of data. So when you deal with data, statisticians are involved. Even the statisticians are actually much ahead of the sort of general mathematics uh, the community. They're very much involved in this already. Uh, you have, you know, statistic, probability, graph theory, pattern rec recognition, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me give you an another example. Now this, I'm through with the Nobel Prizes or potential Nobel Prizes. So these are Nobel Prizes in the, in, the, in the business world. They won't get the Nobel Prize, but they get money. Okay. So remember this page I showed before. What, this is a... Explorer page, and uh, of course everybody knows Google, right? I mean that's my favorite from the beginning. So the key thing that makes Google work, I don't know how many of you know, is this thing here called Page Rank. Some of you probably never look at that. Okay, so uh, next time you go use Google, you look there. Okay, it's called Page. That's like actually the, the secret of Google. Okay. You can type in page rank in Google, you find a lot of stuff. So, you, okay. So, what is page rank? Well, literally, it means the following. Uh, remember, right? The, 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 the idea of search is not to find any relevant information, but to find the few selective, most relevant information. That's the key. So, you want to find the most relevant information. So, the idea is every web page has a, has a rank. So the higher you rank, the more important you are. That's the, that's the idea, okay? So you, you don't want to find anything that is related, but you want to find a highly ranked thing that are related. So the Google story is actually fascinating. Uh, it started by two uh, second year graduate students, I think, uh, at Stanford. This is where Nick and I went to school. Uh, these two guys right there, uh, I thought it was interesting, one of the guys actually called Page. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a page rank, you know, he invented page rank. Uh, so there's actually, if you go to Google, there's a report. This is the title of the technical report that formed the basis of the company. Now it's the biggest internet, you know, other than eBay, it's probably one of the biggest. Uh, you can get that paper, and if, it's actually, I, I read that paper. It's, you know, written by two graduate students, no professors, just the two of them, with basically the whole business plan laid out, the technical basis, <laughs> The business plan, I mean, not in terms of money, but in terms of how to scale up, you know, and so on. It's really uh, amazing. Uh, so, okay, that's, I, I don't want to get into the business side. But here's page rank, the mathematics of it. So the idea is this. Assume that, let's say you're looking at a, a page. The page has these other pages pointing to it, right? You know, there's a link. So the T1 to TN. And CA is how many pages are pointing out of it. Okay, so the idea is this, the idea is your page rank is high if you are being pointed to from a lot of high rank pages. That makes sense actually, right? If a lot of important people think you are important, you are pretty important. 
Okay, so that's really, that's really the concept. But of course the problem is, how do you know? Because you're trying to determine the other guy's page rank too, right? Because if I'm important to him, and I'm important, you know, he's important. So you see that the things are linked together. So how do you find this thing? Okay, so now, so here's a, a formula. That's a key formula in Google. So forget about the D, okay? Forget about this. D is like a fudge factor, we call it, okay? So the, the page rank of you, the, the given page A, it's really the page, it's a sum of the page rank of things that are pointing to it. Right? That, that's sort of the idea. But you have to scale it by how many pages you're pointing to. You, you know, if you're frivolous, you know, you just point to a lot of pages, well, you're discounted. That's the idea. Okay, so that's, that's all there is. And then you put a fudge factor there. But of course, this does not give you an explicit uh, number, right? Because how do you determine the page rank of this page T1? That, it has its own equation. So the whole thing is tied together. Well, it turns out for a mathematician, I don't want to get into detail, but the this is a, it's an eigenvalue problem. Okay, so for those of you who know. And you can use a very simple iterative algorithm. In fact, uh, we know better methods, but when they started, you just iterate on this and you get the eigenvector. So what Google does is that every day is doing a huge eigenvalue problem. Probably, I don't know, 50 billion by 50 billion, you know, uh, thing and it just, you know, it's doing, I mean, that's the, the part of interest to me. I'm sure the, the business end has a lot of interesting stuff. So that's Google. Uh, another thing from the internet. I don't know, I, what, what, how am I doing in time, by the way? Where's Louis? Five more. Five more. Okay, so, okay, good. Uh, so uh, every time you download an image on the internet, you are using very high power mathematics. You may not know it, okay? I'm sure you, you know, right? But when you download a, a big image, these days especially, sometimes you see that uh, things sort of come in a hierarchical way. You know, you get a rough image first, and then you get some more details, and then you get the edges, and you know, and so on. Uh, the thing that makes that possible, the, the thing, it's uh, what's called wavelet. Okay, so here's a, EE times, this is not mathematics, so this is uh, electrical engineering times, about basically uh, about year 2000, they announced that this JPEG 2000, so what I mean, you know the JPEG, you have a digital camera, you know JPEG, so the, but there's a JPEG 2000, there's a newer version, the old, old JPEG is based on a different mathematics, okay, this is, uh, so wavelet compression, that's the idea, it's a big deal and so on, so wavelet, uh, it's a mathematical concept, it's actually very, very precise. It's been studied. Oh, sorry. Let, let, let me back up to this. It's part of that article. It shows you the difference in the power. So here's the original image. It's three megabytes. Here is, uh, so you use, let's say you want to use 19K. Okay, it's a big compression. Uh, with JPEG 2000 and with the original JPEG. The idea is that this is a lot better than this for the same storage, for the, right, so for the same compression. So it's a tremendous difference. By the way, this is also based on mathematics, by the way. This is, I think, yes. Okay, so JPEG, the original JPEG is what's called, uh, based on the cosine transform, the discrete cosine transform. You know cosine, right? It's just the same you learn in high school. It's the, it's the same cosine. It's not any fancier cosine. Uh, JPEG 2000 is based on wavelets. What is wavelet? Well, I don't want to go into technical details. But wavelet has been, the research on it has been done by mathematicians for 100 years. Okay, I must admit that my petition was not looking at application in image compression. It's looking at some deeper question in, for mathematics anyway, a question uh, about wavelets. In fact, one of the uh, sort of breakthroughs in the 80s, this is what I think at least partially responsible for this explosion, for, for why wavelets is now included in this compression, was done by a famous uh, uh, mathematician. Her name is uh, Ingrid Dobishi. She's, I don't know, actually younger than me, I think. So she's, she's around. In fact, I think I have a picture of her right there. Okay. I mean, this is not like, you know, this is live. That's what I mean. It's not like Newton. Okay. <laughs> so, this is, uh, she's a professor at Princeton, which is one of the best departments. She's, uh, I think, Belgian uh, originally. Uh, in fact, so, okay. So it, it's, uh, it's a real thing. It's now uh, impacting a lot of people. Uh, let me just go on with a couple more examples. Uh, here's a company that probably most of you have never heard of. 
but at one time it was worth, uh, I don't know, $10 billion. It's called Akamai. And it's the founder by an uh, MIT professor of mathematics called Tom Layton. I think it's still around. What it does uh, is the idea of caching web pages, for those you who know. So the idea is that you, I'm in Singapore, and I want to look at Google. By the way, you see Google has .sg, actually. It's not you know, in the state. So the idea is that you have these web pages. You have to scatter them around the world so that when they download, you're closest to it. So you get a speed, but you have to keep track of how they are down. So their clients like New York Times and you know, some of these things. I, I mean, this is old. I mean, this is like a few years old. That's the idea. So it turns out the thing, the technology that makes it work is actually mathematics. So you have to, I mean, in fact, this is their website. Their F. You see, those are equations. <laughs> okay. So if you can see them. And they give money to, to support mathematics for kids. Okay, so this is, I, this is uh, supposed to talk about material science, but I don't have time for that. In fact, I was driving by, I was driven, being driven around. You have an A-star institute on material science right on campus. That's what it's about. Okay, so I'm sure. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is for fun. So I, as you know, Los Angeles is the headquarters of entertainment business. Hollywood, it literally is within walking distance. So, so Hollywood now, of course, you see the movies are being dom uh, dominated by a special effects company. The special effects are actually, many of them are, are very technical. Uh, in fact, many of them, well, you call them computer graphics or whatever, but actually a lot of them has to do with uh, mathematics. So here is uh, one of these. Whoops. Did I go back? Uh, uh, how do I go back here? Oh, I can do that. Yeah. So uh, here's a company that we know from uh, you know, 10 minutes from UCLA. But this is an interesting story, by the way. Uh, so these guys were doing, how do I do that? Because I want to start it again. There, OK. <clears throat> so uh, these are the same company. Arate is the one that did the, the water simulation in the Titanic, the movie. OK, so they, they are the water expert, OK, at least at that time. So what happened was this was a company that was not formed by Hollywood people. These were companies that were uh, like a defense firm. They were working for the Navy. They had contracts. They were solving the wave equation. They were looking at submarines, you know, and, and stuff like that. And this is a true story. I know some of the people. They said, well, one day they went to a Holly, uh, Hollywood cocktail party. And they were, met some of the Hollywood people. He said, what do you do? He said, I do waves. He said, oh, I do waves too. <laughs> so these are people doing the Titanic, literally. So they actually got together. And what they did was they wrapped a sort of computer graphics rendering layer on top of this physics stuff and that's that's how they how they did it so as you know the the the, the ship in the titanic never went to sea it's a uh, it's half a ship built in baja california it's stationary on the beach okay so all the water you see out there is really simulated that's the idea and you see something done by the same company so here's a picture of the titanic uh i actually so what's man got to do with it that's the idea right so I actually know uh, Doug Robo, is, uh, he has an Academy Award, but there's a Technical Academy Award. Uh, so this is how it's simulated. These are the dynamics as to how things move. There's a lot of mathematics actually uh, involved in this. Uh, okay, so, so now there's a term called physics-based simulation in Hollywood. Uh, I guess the, you see in the old days when you do cartoon, you, you want to animate the human-like features, right? So you, you sort of... You don't care about the details. But these days, one way to make things look nice is to make them look real. So you just simulate the reality, and that's real. And reality is given by physics so, and mathematics, so that's how you do it. OK, that's sort of the idea. By the way, I should give Stan Osher a, a plug, because he's giving a public talk on Thursday. And he will talk about a lot of this. So I took out some of my slides on this, actually. So let me, uh, I'm coming to the end of my talk. If you don't, uh, uh, so one of these companies, Pixar, I'm sure all of you know, right? Finding Nemo. Uh, here's Steve Jobs, you know, the one who founded Apple Computer. This is a website I downloaded uh, an hour ago. Okay. Toy Story, Monster Inc., Finding Nemo. Uh, well, you know, you know who he is. He's a PR guy. He's a, you know, marketing genius. Well, the guy who's actually running the company is this guy, Ed Catmull. I know probably most of you never heard of him. But he is a hero in computer graphics. 
Okay, so here, in fact, let me see. Here, there, here it is. I know him personally. He, I have a board. He's on my board. Uh, he has a PhD in computer science. In fact, here's the, here's the PhD thesis. Most of you do not know this problem. It's on subdivision algorithm for the display of curved services. So it's really mathematics. I mean, we're doing, you know, subdivision algorithm are very, very much used. In fact, they are related to wavelets. So, you know, what I talked about before, they are related. Okay, so that's, so here's a technical guy, actually, uh, that did this. So let me close by saying something about, you know, what, what, what about this institute that we are involved in? How did they relate to this? Okay, so I have to, here's a web page from NUS. I edited a little bit. Uh, just, this is the current, if you go to the web page, you'll see this. So this is what, what the institute is doing. It's doing imaging science, that's why some of us are here. Then it uh, has a program on microarray analysis. These are the bioinformatics stuff. This is how you, you know, do the gene chips, they, they, they are called, okay? Uh, there, there's another program on physics and bioinformatics. There's one on to economics, and there's one to engineering in some sense, you know, turbulence and so on. So, I mean, so you, you see there's sort of a variety of things that are going on. Uh, I was once director of a math institute in US. Uh, it's called IPAM in LA. There are one at Berkeley, one in Minnesota. At least at that time now, there are three more. Uh, here are some of the programs that are on the web page now today. Uh, proteomics, uh, uh, adaptive optics, this is in, uh, in, uh, in uh, astronomy, <coughs> mathematical challenges, as astronomical imaging. So th this is like a kind of technique. Which, so I think you see the. Uh, we don't just, uh, we practice what we preach, so to speak. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is, that, is that what you say? Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't have to show that. Maybe just for the, for the young people, I say a word about just the two slides about careers. Well, we said that one of the problems with math is that there's no career prospects. Well, uh, traditionally, that's quite true. I mean, in the U.S. at least, you, you, you take a math degree, you end up teaching in K-12, or maybe teach in college. You go into the insurance business, you become an actuary, for example, that's very typical. <coughs> Maybe sometimes into aerospace and so on. I think the newer thing, as I hope I, I've convinced you, is that there's a huge amount of tremendous uh, p opportunities coming up in the biomedical, in the communication, in finance, and so on and so forth. There's really a huge amount of things that you can do. Uh, the emerging things, entertainment, I hope. I haven't even talked about nanotechnology. There's a lot of stuff in there. But I think instead of Instead of trying to guess for the young people now, what will be hot, you know, 15 years from now, you will never able to guess. Google didn't exist, you know, even five years ago. Internet didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, so you cannot. So I think what you want to learn is something fundamental, something that will always be. So I would say math is an excellent foundation for change. That's the idea because it's a fundamental thing. So that, that's hopefully. This is just a chart that shows, this is from our UCLA math department's career guide. Okay, so if you graduate from math, you have these other things. So it, I just, the idea is to show there are a variety of things. I don't want to go into detail on this. So let me come to my last slide. So I hope I've given you a broad overview of this. So remember I started with the myths. So hopefully I have sort of debunked them. Let me repeat them. Map is not fear, map is fun. Map is dynamic. Right? You, you see this thing? It's, it's happening now. It's not like static. It's not boring. It's excitement. It's at the frontiers of science and technology, as I said. Uh, we partner with other sciences. We're not different from the other sciences. Great job prospects. Okay. And it's cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again? You a few oh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Chan, be happy to answer a few questions from you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good, excellent question. If it's something dear to my heart. So the question is, uh, should computer science and math have more 
collaboration, and especially in terms of education, right? Is that the question? So I, I graduated from a computer science department. Okay, I've seen it. When I went to school, the computer science department were new. They were mostly in the U.S. at least. The computer science department were formed from either math department or electrical engineering department, depending on whether you have software and hardware. And in the old days, uh, I think most computer science departments sort of have an identity crisis. You say, I, you know, we call ourselves a science. We've, we sort of spin off from these different departments. So we have to establish our own identity. So typically you see is that, well, okay, in mathematics, for example, you say, if it's continuous mathematics, then it's not computer science. It's discrete mathematics. So, you, you heard the, so when you teach undergrad, you teach them discrete math. You don't teach them calculus, differential equation, because they say, well, that's, that's for those math guys. Right, so, but see, now you've seen over this last 30 years, basically, you know, it, it, you just need whatever tools you need. And I think uh, if you look at uh, genetic algorithm, you look at machine learning, you look at what Google is doing, the way you do internet now, I mean, you use a lot of probability. So you need the basic tools. There's no substitute. I mean, you just need to know that, right? So. Problems don't come in a clean way. They don't come as a computer science problem and only use computer science tools. They just come with basic things. So I think you have to learn the basic stuff. I always tell the undergrads, they say, what you should major in, ask, what should I major in? You're a dean, you know. I say, you know so what you should major in is the most difficult thing that interests you. Because those things you're not going to learn on your own later on. You want to find the basic thing that are very difficult to learn, you learn that. You know, you can go to graduate school, you can then do your profession, you know, make your living. But you have to learn the basic, math is certainly one of those. And so if you are inclined towards science, I always say you learn the math, physics, you know, whatever it is. Computer is very important, computer, right? So computer science, I would say, is one of these basic tools now. So I actually don't, I see the field at first, computer science and math are diverging, but now it's actually coming back, being forced by the need. That, that's how I see it. Yes. Oh yeah, there are many. First of all, I should say I'm not a financial, you know, expert. So don't take my advice and go invest in Wall Street or anything like that. So, so, uh, but you ask a mathematical question. Actually, there are many people who do that. I mean, in a way, wavelet is like that, right? Wavelet is trying to decompose certain functions into simpler form. So you look at the broad overall structure, then you look at some more details and so on. So there are people who also try to do that to uh, geometry, surfaces, curves, and things like that. So yes, that's. That's what you do. But I think the question you're trying to do is, if you separate out, does it have a relevance to the financial market? That, that I cannot answer. I'm not really an expert on that. Yeah. No? Sorry. Yeah. Well, as I said, so, you, you, wavelet is sort of one generic way to do that. I mean, of course, you cannot just apply, you have to represent the curve. Uh, you know, for example, uh, for those who, I, I gave a talk on level sets, so that's one example. You, then you, you can then decompose functions. So there are people who do that. For those of you who are familiar with uh, com computer uh, implicit, implicit services and so on, so you can then compress those, represent those. That's a very technical question. Maybe we should take it offline. Yeah. I, I should say that the, the question actually is about charting. And charting, usually yeah. Usually the economists and the, and the finance guys, they don't believe in charting. Yeah. I mean, stock market guys may believe in charting, but the finance guys don't believe in charting. The black show stuff is not about charting. No, yeah. It's about arbitrage. That's the key. Yeah. yeah, that's a key concept. Yeah.
Let's do mathematics. Yeah. Any more questions? <coughs> There's one in the back. Yeah. <coughs> I can't hear you, sorry. sorry. Mathematical English. Mathematical English. Uh, well, that's an interesting, not really. I mean, you know, I mean, I, we all know about, uh, we actually have a former mathematician that you said who studied the, the, the Jewish Bible, the, the Torah. Is it the Torah? Yeah, so, but I mean, that's, that's sort of in the fringe. But what I, what, what I learned actually when I was directing the institute is there's a lot of mathematical application in the humanities and social sciences. For example, in anthropology, you would think there's nothing to do with the way you study uh, relationships, kinships, and so on. It's actually quite mathematical. Uh, yes, I mean, so we were going to run the program on that uh, program. For example, the way people are now tracing human migration, it's actually genetic, it's through genetics. And there's a lot of mathematics involved in that. So, yes, I think there's going to be a lot of connection in that, but English is really quite far there, so I, <laughs> I do not know. Yeah. Any more questions? There's one more back there. Prime, yeah, I read about it in the Straight Times. Yes, I, I was thinking about putting the, so what's your question? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, you know, yeah. Well, you, I think I have an example about factoring, uh, you know, large uh, numbers, and that's, so these prime potentially could be useful in cryptography. Okay, so the whole idea of, uh, you know, cryptography, encoding things, is that you can multiply large numbers and primes together, but you cannot factor them so easily. That's the whole basis, one, one of the methods. So you need these large primes. Now, I don't think the people there were doing it for that, with that in mind. That's sort of the, the part that is, you know, that's the arts part that hopefully later on we have application. But prime numbers are key to crypto cryptography. Yeah, so there could be, potentially. I was thinking about that, actually, when I went. Yes, this is the one in the Straight Times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I actually read it here. I, I was here. These are special primes. They are 2 to the p minus 1 uh, nursing part. Yeah, actually, thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Thank yeah, you for pointing it out. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I my page rank at Google is very high. <laughs> I look. I if you say Tony Chen, I'm number one. So you can find my address, huh? Yeah, Tony Chen, C H A N, and you'll find me. At least the last I checked, I'm still number one. <laughs> The mini Tony Chan, it was a very common name, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting question. I mean, Singapore is well known around the world. You know, any test, Tim's or, you know, Singapore is always number one or number two. It's really impressive, you know. Uh, so you must have a, a system that's working quite well. So, you know, I mean, who am I, you know? Uh, but I think in general, if you compare sort of Asian countries, I would say, so, you know, to, let's say, the American system. American system, I mean, you know, the high school system have been really scorned, you know, and uh, ridiculed, <laughs> ridiculed by, by many, many people. So, uh, but one thing you notice is that many of the top mathematicians or scientists are really uh, also American. What it is is uh, the way they are, they, they are so sort of left alone to think, to train, to be unusual. I think somehow that part must have something to do with it. So I think uh, you, it's a balance, you know. You, 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 I don't think you want to be too rigid. You've you got to say, you've got to study this and that's it. You gotta have something to allow some sort of creativity that is involved because you're not gonna learn all the mathematics when you're in high school. It's more important to know how to think, how to open your eyes, how to be creative. I, I don't know how you teach creativity, but certainly the environment has something to do with it. Okay? I mean think about these two guys at Stanford. How did they think about Google? I mean when I tell you that you you know, it's easy, right? After the fact. 
they supposed to get their PhD. They were sitting there, and yet they, they well, they never got their PhD. So, <laughs> it's, uh, so, so I, I don't know how to. Many people try to recreate Silicon Valley, you know, elsewhere. You know, it's not easy to do. But I think uh, in terms of the the uh, Asian, because I grew up in the Asian, you know, culture and and being educated actually, is that somehow I think that's the key part that is that can be improved. That could be tipped the balance a little bit over to the other side. That would be my own personal feeling. No, no. In fact, you, you, you saw, so the question that you heard, right? So should we get away, do away with the core mathematics and just do the... In fact, my point is that you've got to learn the core stuff. You, you gotta, but you, it's a balance. You don't want to, you know, in many math departments, right, you say, this is math and this is not math. You say, well, just learn this, learn the epsilon delta and forget about this other stuff. Let the engineers do it, they would say. I don't think that's tipping the balance off too much on the other side. But certainly, I, I, I've been arguing that you have to learn the basic stuff. I think computer science should learn some physics, y you know, and, and math, and whatever the basic stuff. Because, <coughs> you know, your career is 40, 50 years. Things are going to change, you know, two, three, four times in your career. You cannot predict what you're going to need. And the, the, the stuff we do is technical, it's, uh, it's quantitative, uh, you know. So, you, you know, you need those tools. That, that's it. I mean, that's the only thing you can predict at this point. So I was advocate teaching more mathematics in computer science curriculum. Because I know in the U.S. at least, you know, undergrads in, math, in computer science, uh, they do not have to take a lot of math courses. Not like, say, electrical engineers, you know, and so on. So I, I think that's very dangerous, actually. I mean, there's a easy to just try to learn the, the newest sort of technological tool, you know, the newest language, the newest whatever, you know. If you're going to get a job in the IT business, you've got to know C++ and you've got to do that. Of course, those are important, but in a way, don't, I, mean, I can guarantee you C++ will not be around 50 years from now. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be called, but you know, it will be something else, right? It will be another model or whatever. But you have to really learn the basic stuff. That's how I, my own feeling. This is personal. Tony, I'm uh, quite amused by your two sets of equations. <clears throat> the first set starting with mathematics equals fear, mm -hmm. and the set, second set starting yeah. with mathematics equals joy. <laughs> I hope that uh, most of us will go home remembering the right set of equations. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, with this note, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Chan again.